Kanya. I am a Global Innovation Fellow at CCIT. I welcome you all to the third iteration of MedJack webinar series. Allow me to uh, allow me to give a brief overview of our series uh, for those who might be new to the community. We launched a book back in 2011. Uh, that's a Q's first ebook called MedJack. It contains uh, all 2021. the 2021. 2021. Sorry, yeah. Sorry, mm -hmm. 2021. Uh, that's a first ebook called Magic. It contains all the experiences of CCIT, encompassing both the highs and the lows. It's been co-authored by 14 authors, and each time we use a chapter of our book as a conversation starter, we invite our panelists and we provide them with a chance to share their journey around innovation, creativity, and entrepreneurship, which we like to call as ICE. So, with that, I would like to introduce our esteemed moderator of today. That's Dr. Asad. Dr. Asad wears multiple hats as a professor in emergency medicine and as the director of CCIT. His wealth of expertise and experience add, adds a unique dimension to our discussions. Thank you, Dr. Asad. Pleasure and to be here. Moving forward, we have uh, we are privileged to have Dr. Jabeen Fayaz as our first guest. She's an assistant professor at the world famous Children's Hospital in Toronto called Sick Kids, affiliated with the University of Toronto. Dr. Fayaz is a medical visionary with an illustrious career spanning several continents. From Pakistan to Canada, Dr. Fayaz's journey uh, in pediatrics medicine has been marked by a rel uh, relentless pursuit of excellence. Her commitment to simulation-based education has not only transformed medical training, but has also transcended borders, reaching scores of communities in Pakistan, India, UAE, Egypt, Ireland, and Canada. With a remarkable background in medical education and simulation, Dr. Fayaz is a true catalyst for change, fostering a culture of innovation that touches lives worldwide. Thank you, Dr. Jabeen, for being here. Thank you so much. It's my utmost pleasure to be here and have this conversation. Thank you. Joining Dr. Fayaz is her colleague from SickKids, Dr. Sasha Litwin, an assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Toronto. Dr. Litwin is a beacon of creativity and change. Dr. Litwin's journey is a testament to the power of using art and science. Her expertise lies in hu using human-centered design methods to revolutionize the med emergency department experience for children and families. Driven by an insatiable uh, curiosity and an unwavering belief in the fusion of art and healthcare, Dr. Uh, Litman embodies the essence of innovation that transcends traditional boundaries. Thank you, Dr. Litman. Thank you. This is a great intro. Thanks for having me. With that, I'd like to give the floor to Dr. Sad. To the esteemed moderator. <laughs> to the esteemed <laughs> moderator, which makes me feel, um, I don't know why, <laughs> somewhat of a dinosaur, esteemed dinosaur. So I uh, thank you very much, Zanera. So Zanera is one of our Global Innovation Fellows, and uh, our other Innovation Fellows are also here in this space. This space, as uh, Jabeen, you mentioned that you hadn't seen this new building, but Sasha and Jabeen, this is a uh, this is the first tower uh, on campus, and it's a 14 or 15 floor building. AQ, uh, Sasha, if you ever get to uh, visit Karachi and see AKU, the campus, none of the buildings over here are more than maybe three floors max. They go to four floors, and that's all. Oh, that's a, that's a tower, but it's not really a tower. This is the real true tower over here, and we're sitting on the 10th floor. We just have blinds right now because it, it, there's a lot of light that comes through, but it's a beautiful view of, of, of the lakes uh, on campus. So um, the 10th floor has uh, the D-Lab, just for you to, uh, because uh, Sasha, you're interested in design thinking. So the D-Lab is the development lab and it's a creativity hub, creative space. Uh, we also do a lot of innovation work over here, team-based team innovation work and Incubation, so early stage business incubation of startups over here as well. And so it's a multi-purpose space and it's a lot of fun. Um, so I just wanted to kind of tell you a bit about where the location is right now. Um, and um, what we uh, uh, routinely do through the MedJack webinars is that we use one of the chapters of the book, MedJack. Um, this is a print copy of the book. Um, and we use one of those 10 chapters as a conversation starter. Today, we picked chapter nine for you, which uh, is the, the title of the chapter nine is C2, uh, hashtag C2I, create to innovate expansion from the merely technical to the metaphorical. So that's chapter nine of MedJack. And very briefly, it makes the case 
uh, about going past health and disease towards human development to sustainably improve the human condition. And it talks about um, innovating at the intersection of health, humanities, arts, and social sciences, um, and so on. And it could be more fields or fewer fields, but as long as it's two or more fields kind of playing together and at the intersection of that, that's where a lot of fun happens and magic happens. And so we are, we've been making the point about like breaking down silos that healthcare cannot just be dealt uh, with by people from healthcare backgrounds only. It's got, you've got to open up and art and design and humanities and social sciences have a lot to offer. So um, chapter nine is about that. Chapter nine also makes the point about re-engineering the undergrad medical education experience using design thinking. And we want to get into a conversation today about design thinking um, and how all of these things are adding up um, and contributing to the 21st century learner skill set. So with that preamble, uh, chapter nine's preamble, uh, which we shared with you, and uh, we want to just delve into the conversation now. And I'm going to start off with Jabin. Because Jabin, you're very familiar with AQ, obviously. And when I first moved back to, well, first, I've been here since, um, I moved to AQ 10 years ago. I had moved from the US after training and practicing over there. And Jabin was my colleague uh, at uh, AQ in pediatric emergency medicine. And now Jabin is my colleague uh, in, in the West, and I'm here. So it's really interesting how things kind of, you know, how people move, right? Move from one geography to another, from one continent to another. They learn different things and they, take the previous uh, work and then they morph it into something new because, because of the newer experiences. So my question, sorry for the mouthful, but Jabin, my question was that you've been here, you've, you've practiced, you've trained and practiced in Pakistan, then you moved to several other countries actually, right? So you were in the Middle East and then um, not several other countries, but Middle East and you practiced over there, then you moved to Canada, you, you trained over there, uh, you did your fellowship in pediatric emergency medicine over there, and they did simulation work over there, and you trained in simulation, uh, medical simulation. So now with, with, with all of this uh, wealth of experience of different geographies, um, low income, low middle income country, high income country, how do you put this together? I know it's going to be a very, um, you know, it's going to be a very broad base, but as well, if you could contain it, how do you put it together and how has that influenced your take or your gauge on innovation. Let's start off there. And you could use your own area, which is medical education, let's say, and innovation through simulation. So why not just make it even more relevant and specific? Let's start there. Yeah, thank you so much, Asad. Um, it's, um, I cannot tell you how happy I'm, I'm, I'm to talk uh, in this forum. First of all, being alumni at AKU and it felt like a home being at home. Uh, so thank you for providing us this opportunity and being here with Sasha is kind of an added uh, cherry on the cake. So what I will start, um, I would say, if I reflect back, uh, uh, if I see my journey, it allowed me to witness a wide spectrum of healthcare practices, how we work emergency or practice emergency or teach our resident in Pakistan, and then Oman and Canada. And as you mentioned, it is a wide experience from low resource to high resource setting. So what this uh, made me uh, aware that there is a need of innovation in healthcare. One thing that work in Pakistan or Oman and Canada may work, like the medicine is the same. You will manage asthma as always following the same guidelines and same pathways. But the processes, the care, the uh, methodology that how we teach our residents or learners or faculty um, is quite different. And then I also get a firsthand knowledge about the challenges that are faced by healthcare, that the challenges in Pakistani setting versus Oman setting in Canada are completely different. So this insight further fueled my passion for the healthcare education. And I recognize that uh, the education cannot follow the normal norms. We need to be innovative. We need to be um, uh, do something or evolve um, uh, our educational strategies if we want to really prepare our future healthcare professionals. 
For example, there's not a lot of trend of interprofessional education in Pakistan or Oman, frankly speaking. But I really learned here how important it is to teach interprofessionally and to involve the team and to have everybody on the table. And as you said, that um, all this will emph perspective emphasize the importance of fast fostering a mindset of adaptability, creativity, and problem solving. And not when I become a physician. Uh, when I was a med student, I al always been exposed to books. I know the theory very well. I have a very good understanding about anatomy, physiology, everything. But how to apply it? What are the uniqueness of healthcare environment? How to communicate? How to execute? I was not at all aware of these concepts. And then I learned something hard way, something my mentors made me learn. So I don't think so uh, This in this era where technology and uh, uh, advancement is there that we should expose our learners at any level. Like I think myself a learner at this level as well. So any level of learners should not have to go through all this to learn. They should be exposed right from the undergraduate medical school school level, um, especially with the, the world has become a global village now. This is a very old saying, but you can utilize any expertise, which is the example. You are sitting at AKU, I'm sitting in Canada and Sasha, like at different places, but we are still interacting. We are still able to learn. So I think this is the biggest learning, I feel like, uh, to break the silos, collaborate, innovate, uh, be open mind, uh, be creative, uh, take the, like, do not, uh, the thing is that we always uh, talk about what uh, are the problems, but nobody think about solutions. The solutions are right there in front of you. You just need to be open minded and adaptable, and then focus more on the solutions and think of low uh, cost, innovative mm. uh, strategies, and this will help. I think this is the biggest learning I have over like my journey of almost 18 years now. <laughs> that's that's excellent. Thank you so much. And and Javina was really nicely put together because it's been a it, it's, it's it's a long time period and you've kind of summed it up really nicely. And I'll I'll mention some of the points you you raised. Perhaps I'm I'm going to be paraphrasing it over here, but um, adaptability. The world's a global village, um, and I think lifelong learning is what I also kind of tend to think about, you know, when you say that you're always going to be a learner and it's always good to consider oneself to be always a learner as well, because then you're constantly creating and innovating then, right? You you don't have that expert hat on all the time. And why should you have an expert's hat on? Because I think with, 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 with the ability to kind of constantly learn, then you're also kind of humble that, okay, I don't know and I'm willing to learn and I can make mistakes as well. Um, and I can learn from those mistakes and then improve. So so, so thank you for that, getting us started. So, so Jabeen, um, so the chapter talks about um, this phrase. Right? So it's, it's, it's a catchy phrase, uh, in my opinion, create to innovate, okay? So I don't know at times, I wonder whether one needs to create and then you start innovating on that creativity or, or is it the other way around or does it really matter? So, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm like, you know, does it, you know, how important is it to really, really start creating first, and then you start innovating on that prototype. So, regardless, um, how have you witnessed the importance of cross-disciplinary collaboration and innovation in your work, particularly in the field of simulation-based education? So, if you could talk specifically uh, to simulation and and cross-disciplinarity, and I think you mentioned some of this already. That, um, that you're working with different people in different areas and different disciplines. So perhaps you could expand on that. Yeah, definitely. I, As I mentioned earlier, that uh, you cannot work in silo. If you have to create impact, you need to be... Uh, um, you need to be um, very much um, open to collaboration and the collaboration should be cross-disciplinary collaboration. I'm not talking about physician to physician collaboration. It is not going to do anything. The most I learned, I learned from my nursing colleagues. Yeah. I learned most from my respiratory therapist colleague, from my social worker, from my students and learners who are being taught in this new era. So basically cross-disciplinary collaboration is the pivotal for in simulation based 
based education because it bring professionals together from diverse background, not only from healthcare, but education, technology, and from other uh, healthcare services, which we completely ignore. And by saying that, how many times we uh, bring to the table uh, stakeholders like our clerks who do so much of processes, have we ever involved them? How much time we uh, bring to the table our pharmacy on call? And medication error is the most important or common error that happened, but they are not on the table, and especially language services. Mm. So I, what I mean to say that cross Collab uh, disciplinary collaboration does not include physician nurses. It is more broader and wider than that. And then this amalgamation of expertise, if we are able to achieve, allows a holistic approach for designing and implementing simulation program. So for example, um, I'm giving you an example uh, uh, of Canada and then from Pakistan as well, that we implemented this uh, acute event clinical debriefing where we debrief all the acute events. For example, a cardiac arrest happened in our department, all the stakeholders, including physician, nurses, clerk, social worker, respiratory therapist, sit for five minutes with a focus uh, what went well in not in terms of medical management. Medical management is just a smaller part of it. Like you, uh, uh, you, you can improve the medical management, but these are algorithms which are always present, and you can provide them notes for that. It's more broader than that. And if then it will the care that we provided only improve if we start thinking more than the medical management. What went well in the medical management? What went well in the system and processes? And what went well uh, in teams? And where are the opportunities to improve? And what are some of your thoughts? So we do this for five to seven minutes, and then we. Take Take it upon and it happens for uh after each acute event clinical debriefing and we find out so many latent safety threats uh in our system uh, that we are working upon and it leads to so much changes in our department. For example, we improve our processes of uh, activating the neonatal team or ICU team. We reduce the, uh, the uh, by uh, using the Lean Sigma approach, the wastages in our processes. And that led to automatically uh, patient safety, quality of care improvement. And then it also lead to wellness because you, it, it's a, it's a taboo, I would say, that don't talk about uh, these acute events because it is stressful. It's not stressful. When people see everybody sitting on the table and talking about what uh, errors they uh, are the potential that made or what are some of the things they can do better, it will really decongest because they see everyone sitting on the same table and talking about same things. So it creates a culture. So you cannot change these things uh, in, in a day or in a week. You have to create a culture and that culture should be all across the organization so that what you are speaking, your clerk is understanding and I am taking their names again and again because I feel like they are also the foundational element of our system. So this is one example. Second example, people always think as a barrier, distance as a barrier, resources as a barrier. So here from Pakistan, we have uh, done at least uh, now three years um, many, many program with Pakistan, including Indus Hospital and also others medical colleges through distance simulation. And we have trained um, almost uh, 68 uh, learners over the time. We have done the first um, uh, cohort of our PEM certification program and all utilizing simulation. And what the cost was, definitely faculty time, uh, organization, but a Zoom link, which is available, uh, that which I'm happy to provide. So it's actually on a zero cost if we uh, exclude the faculty time and everybody's so happy to volunteer their time. So this is, and then uh, Asad, I heard you saying, uh, create to innovate or innovate to create. I don't think it's a one way stream. I think it's a continuum. Uh, everything informed each other. Mm. You find a gap, you find an opportunity, you try to work to innovate to fill that gap. And then your innovation inform you to make it better. 
and then this cycle will continue uh, as much you utilize. So I always see it as a continuum, uh, even not a two-way stream. It's kind of a circle where many other factors keep on, uh, uh, like inform you that how to make that innovation better. Um, and it will, creativity and innovation continue to happen all along my life. Like I remember at least the first case of simulation, which I did now I have done it maybe a hundred times, but every time I do, I find something to change mm -hmm. and I've got some idea, oh, we should do uh, it in this way. So these are a couple of my thoughts uh, on your response. Thank you. And th th these are these are beautiful and uh, really, very, um, really insightful thoughts actually, right? So you've kind of answered the question and very nicely. So just to re-emphasize, you spoke a lot about cross-disciplinary collaboration. You're saying it's really important to consider the, the non-healthcare folks in your teams because they have a lot to offer. Nobody asks them. And so when you do um, simulation-based um, training um, and in your um, scenarios, you do include those other people as well. And 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 I think that's that kind of kind of really segues nicely into my example of hackathons and so sasha you had mentioned hackathons just before we got started we've done several we've done so many over here at aq now and all of those events are cross-disciplinary interdisciplinary and we actually go out looking for people who are non-medics non-doctors non-nurses and it folks or or engineers or or um, humanities art social sciences folks because they have a lot to offer so why am i mentioning this because we're going to pivot into the next topic and we're going to get Sasha into the conversation. So Sasha, you're a design thinker, okay? And you've, you've trained um, and you've, your experience with human-centered design methods um, have enabled you to have a really, I would say, really cool grasp of playing at the intersection of art and science. Um, so how do you think, In maybe you could give us an example or two, how in your own experience has that contributed to solutions in healthcare? Art, fused with yeah. science. So, so thanks. So, so yeah, so I design thinking, human centered design, I think you could call it either and different books and different schools call it different things. But, but, but I think that's a really important first question because sometimes and oftentimes I see solutions in healthcare that, that are, you know, worked on teams and working groups and people put a lot of time and effort and a lot of resources into something and they implement the thing, but they didn't do what I think is the crucial first step, which is the human centered first step, which is what you're both talking about, which is the, who are the people that are actually gonna use it? Who's gonna be affected by it? And, and how does that inform what this solution actually is? And so for me, every single thing I do, big or small, I try and go back to say, you can say stakeholders or not, but who are the people and who are the people that will be affected and how do we get their opinion? And um, I'll give an example that happened, I think just a couple of weeks ago, I was in a simulation for a code orange. I just happened to be the sort of TTL acute physician on. And so all of a sudden um, a piece of paper is in my hand. It's my, you know, the code orange team had worked very, very hard over a number of years to create activity kind of, um, activity lists for each member of the Code Orange team. So for example, the TTL lead physician has a piece of paper that says, you're responsible for these tasks during a, a mass casualty. And honestly, I hadn't seen it before. I was having trouble following it, you know? And then, and then that made me think, you know, if I'm having trouble following it, I bet our clerk is too, because the clerk has a sheet, the, the charge nurse has a sheet. And I think, it was well-intended and excellently done. If you're on the working group and you understand all the intricacies of what Code Orange is, but if you're getting this for the first time in a stressful situation, and it was just simulation, but it's still stressful. You feel that obviously, like the simulation's excellent. So I sort of, I said to the group, like, like let's do the human-centered, person-centered approach. Like we missed that. Let's take the sheet, print it, put it in front of the clerk, say, what's wrong with this? What do you understand what you don't? And like, let's see how this makes sense to you. And then same for each person. And I think I think that's forgotten so often. And I'm surprised every time that it is. So I guess the long answer to your question is the person, human, patient first approach of asking the questions, figuring out what people want and need, 
finding a way to get that information to inform what your solution is. And Great. then Great. can I do the second part? Yeah, please, please. <laughs> this is a, yeah. my long, long yeah. monologue. Huh. <laughs> you just asked me the stuff I love to talk about. Oh, please go ahead. I think like the second part is the innovation is, you know, the creative mindset, which is my real passion. Um, you know, uh, there's really no innovation without that, that ability to think differently, take a different perspective, try something different, bring something from a different industry, you know, that works. Um, I have lots of examples, but we can get to them. But I think those two components of human centered and creative mindset are, are the things that I, that I always go back to when I'm trying to create something. That's that's um, that's really um, insightful. Thank you for that. So for for folks who are not familiar, um, um, we've got a number of people on this call. Thank you everyone for being here. Just uh, yeah, a bit of uh, housekeeping. So if people have questions and comments, listen, we're going to interrupt the conversation because it's really important to uh, to us that we get our audiences uh, questions or comments across to you to uh, to uh, Sasha and Jabin. Okay, so please um, don't don't hesitate. Don't be shy. Okay. Uh, go ahead and ask your questions or put in a comment and, and we, we are happy to interrupt. Okay. So, so going back to design thinking, right? So Sasha, so you, you mentioned, um, and I think that's really nicely put together and, and, and there are obviously there, um, uh, good examples as well and specific examples that you can get into for us as well. Tell me a bit. Okay. So you have an interest in, um, what's, what's your background? if any, in art specifically? And, and is it creative art or is it painting or something along those lines? Um, Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, well, that was, I just wanted to know if, if, yeah, if sure. art and design yeah, so, is something that you yeah. pursued at the, at the undergrad, the college level, and then you uh, pursued medicine or how, how, what was your experience, what was your journey? So, so, you know, so even in high school, you know, like secondary school, I was, I loved science for sure. And I loved art and I was sort of always kind of trapped between and the art people and the science people, they just, at least in my experience, there was this divide and mm -hmm. like, and I found that all the way through for the last probably 25 years. Like, it's like, and then, so I go to university, I went in the U S and I was taking fine arts. I did sculpture mostly. Um, uh, so, you know, I'm in the art studio and I remember this, we were talking about the, the painter, Andy Pollock, mm. uh, no, not, sorry, Jackson Pollock, you know, he's like splatters a lot yeah. of stuff. So, and, and the, the professor said, you know, the person who wouldn't understand this painting is the neuroscience major. You know, I was a neuroscience major. I was just secret about it. So I was going back and forth between the biology, neuroscience, this stuff that I thought was so interesting pre-med and then I would go to the art studio where I had to sort of keep quiet about it. And there was no intersection, right? So, so then I get to, you know, medical school and training and all of that creativity is, at least in my experience, totally stifled, squashed, like, don't say art, don't say creativity, just like follow the, follow the lines, follow the, the leader. Um, and then I started, this is the truth, I started Googling um, how to be a doctor and an artist at the same time during my fellowship in pediatric emergency medicine. Cause I said, I, I have this like love for creating things. It's in me. How do I must find a way to do it. I can't just do great Halloween costumes and great like side piece art things. And I, you know, so, so anyways, finally I, I Googled, I found a link called the design thinking. I'd never heard of that before. I was well into my career and I thought this this makes sense. This I can do in medicine and is creative. And so I did a master's in design at a Toronto university. And since then, I've just been trying to merge the two and find like these sort of ways to be very creative and innovative in a quite traditional space. That's, that's, that's fascinating. So, so thank you for sharing um, that experience with us. And, you know, when you were talking about like uh, you, you were Googling, and now it's chat GPTing. So actually, <laughs> up to me, I I'm putting things in chat GPT. Okay, how can I be a, a doctor who's really interested in creative writing as well? Okay, so because it's not right. it's not rocket science, it's not something new. People have been doing this for, for ages. And I think it's just because when we go through med school and we're like, uh, and residency fellowship and so on and so forth and faculty experience, uh, you're, you're very right. I think the creative aspect of it is kind of stifled. 
it's either pushed out of us and then and then we by the time you're like too old and then we're like so i'm i'm glad that you 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 were able to kind of like um, merge these um and and this 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 evolution actually if i may uh and the new things that are coming out where when i think about your journey and so this this this, this maybe it's it's part of one's identity formation who knows i mean like you know how many different things you learn about yourself through this um uh, pursuit um when you're fusing different things so i love it thank you so much um so uh, give us an example perhaps of uh a human centered design approach uh, and how that led to a novel solution in the ed experience for children and their parents or their families sure um i have I have, you know, I have some examples that are my own personal examples, and I think they probably, I, I, we, we live, we work and live in this high resource setting, but my work is like, you know, really grassroots. Like, I don't have a lot of funding. I have tiny little grants, and so what I do is really just very, very cheap prototyping. Um, and so, so one example. This, this was in the last few months. I. I kept noticing and for years that that the patients and the parent, the families, they can't find their way around our emergency department. Our, you know, number one in North American emergency department is it's it's confusing. They can't, and the top things when I, you know, I did some surveying, which I kind of do, I'm always like sort of asking around. That's my thing, asking parents, asking what what do people, what are people, what are the things people are trying to find? So they want to find the washroom. They want to find water and they want to know how to enter and exit. You know, it's so simple, um, but they couldn't find that because the signage is very poor. You know, I don't know if it's like this in your hospital, but, you know, the exit is like it's a green button that you have to press to open the doors. But the sign says press the red button. And then there's 12 other signs around it saying what to do. And then a few stickers. And it's just totally confusing. And so one day after my night shift, I'm like nice and disinhibited. And I just, I just printed new signs. I just peeled off all the old stuff, tape it up. And then, you know, I start to get feedback. And then I start to actually do some formal surveying to see, are people still lost? Uh, you know, where are they lost? What do they think? Start to get feedback from some of the staff members. And then I keep going and buying. Now I'm going, buying colored cardstock and printing it at home. I'm taping it up after shifts. And I've sort of iterated on signage for a couple of weeks. And then I'm adding languages. So what's our top five languages? I wish I, I could show you a picture, but then people started adding in their own languages to the signs. So now we have signs with multiple languages. Um, and it's just, it's, it's, it's like a very simple solution. But when I watch parents at the exit to the emergency department, they can leave. It's miraculous. And it's simple and it's cheap. It's just, to me, it's like a very simple example that's inexpensive and just like someone on the front line seeing a problem, doing something to, to try and make it better. That's a, that's, a, that's a great example. It's simple, it's 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 elegant, um, and I love it. So we've got some comments piling up so we can start going through this. Um, but did you mention that um, uh, the number one ED in North America, pediatric ED, is that sick kids? Is that it's possible. I guess we're t kind of top three always dueling with um, Philadelphia Children's, and Texas Children's Hospital. Well. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, there's there's probably. I don't I'm want to say number one. <laughs> you from, from you trained in Texas. Texas Children's Hospital. Okay, just joking. No, but um, okay. So <laughs> let's, let's look at some of the comments or questions. Uh, oh, okay. I think that's. Let's see. I'm just gonna. Oh, okay. That's, this is good. So I can read this. Uh, I think uh, Murad Khan has written a comment or a question. Yeah. The Canadian Pakistani health system, yeah, it's just bringing your attention. <clears throat> okay, there's a question as well. Okay, so let's yeah. let's let's go with this one then. So Dr. Murad is asking uh, the Canadian and Pakistani healthcare systems are very different. In Pakistan, seventy to ninety percent healthcare is out of pocket, while innovation can improve and make patient care safer in settings like Pakistan. Does this lower the cost of care? Is there in, any evidence from AQU, the fee for service healthcare institution? Uh, well, this question is addressed to, uh, is there any evidence from AQU? So uh, about um, uh, making things, uh, lowering the cost. I don't think we have got examples of actual processes that innovation-based processes 
that have led to, or I don't even know whether we've been tracking these things or evaluating these things, but in your experience, would you be able to... to, uh, to like, I will tell you, uh, people think we are, we have a lot of money, which is not true. <laughs> we are also resource constrained. And we also have to make up our case uh, why we are spending and on what we are spending money. And it is very, very true that uh, education, and as Sasha is alluding to these innovation kind, does not get any traction. You have to prove or struggle a lot to sell your idea and get money for that. So frankly speaking, I work at AKU and I work in Oman and Canada, which are like high resource setting. I do not find much difference in terms of uh, our struggles uh, to get resources and funding for education and innovation I'm talking about in particular. But we always look for the upfront cost. We forget the behind the scene cost. So um, if by such small interventions, like Sasha was alluding to, we can make our environment less risk prone or identify the latent safety threats before it has reached to the patient, like imagine a medication error leading to a patient going to ICU, the cost of it versus identifying it by simple solution and avoiding that to happen is a cost saving as well which we most of the time don't consider as a cost saving. So it is a very, very important aspect that Murad has brought up that always looking at, uh, like numbers speak, this is the reality and this is the fact that how we can translate our simple intervention, which are educational and creativity, human design, in translate them in terms of uh, in terms of the money that the system will be saving uh, by implementing that and that will track the traction of the leadership and they become excited and they want to spend on that so i would uh, have this is what my take on this comment or question i and and just to add to that so i think that's that's very really well uh, addressed uh, jabeen and so um Recently, in, in, in our innovation um, uh, class, uh, I think it was just maybe last week, there was a paper that we were discussing. It was an article out of the US and was talking about how, in spite of having cutting edge uh, technology and innovation, tech innovation in the US, the healthcare costs have been skyrocketing. And so when you, when you scratch the surface and you delve into it further, you start realizing the different kinds of innovations that are happening. So, so there in that particular article or paper, they were they were kind of categorizing it into process-based innovation and content-based innovation. So what you're describing, Jabeen, that simple interventions, patient safety related, patient quality related, uh, would fall under process-based innovation. And they're definitely found to have uh, good outcomes and positive outcomes and potentially have the ability to uh, lower uh, healthcare costs versus content-based innovation, which would include all your, uh, um, you know, the 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 fancier, more expensive tech technology and newer drugs coming out, perhaps radiological um, imaging techniques and everything that's kind of fancier and uh, will will um, in increase your healthcare costs. So, thank you for that. And so, there's another comment here. I'm just going to read it off. Okay, it's Dr. Janaid's. Uh, oh, that's a comment, actually. It's not a question. Okay. Such an interesting discussion and excellent panel. Thanks for organizing it. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much. We appreciate that. We, we appreciate all the love that we can get. And I'll see if I can find... Uh, yeah. We have a comment? Uh, oh. Yeah. Oh. And then one thing, Asad, I was uh, want to take this opportunity to clarify that people think that simulation is only to educate. The, the horizon of simulation is much, much broader. The simulation is being now utilized for process, system changes, system thinking, finding out like the, now, now the simulation is if you are building an emergency department, build it with cardboard, test that system and then build it because like you will uh, have to find out the like in our emergency department exactly what Sasha said even the simple signage if you have tested that system then you have find it out and in testing of the system and processes every human counts it is the end users 
It is all the people who are working in that environment. Also, simulation is for uh, cultural um, EDI learning, for physician burnout, for physician wellness, communication, teamwork, confidence building. So it's not, uh, simulation is not to teach uh, learners or residents just how to treat a patient with a septic shock. This is a very, very bare minimal utilization of simulation. And when I talk more and more to people, they uh, limit the simulation as the pedagogy to uh, teach septic shock or to make them learn how to intubate the patient. This is like we are sitting in the era of uh, 10 years back where the utilization was only education and learning. Now it has limitless boundaries i would say <laughs> and the sky's the limit that's that's a that's a great point uh, and thank you for raising that point jabeen and it gets me to think about um although we so so sasha had asked about hackathons and and we were talking about child centric well we haven't got into child centric design but one of the hackathons or the second hackathon we had over here was on pediatrics and child health and we were envisioning or the department of pediatrics and we had partnered um that we were envisioning the the, the next Generation Children's Hospital of AKU, and so for that hackathon, as as a as one aspect of that, we invited uh, around two dozen children, different ages, the whole age spectrum, and we gave them models. We gave, well, not such models. They created models. We gave them cardboard. So you mentioned cardboard, Jabeen. So we gave them cardboard. We gave them color uh, markers, pencils, and string, and word, and so on and so forth. So we said, okay, here, create your um uh, you know imagine what could this look like and they had such a fabulous time and they created their own uh, using those um uh tools uh that content and uh so you know i'm just thinking now jabeen that for for something that, that was also simulation in my mind that is simulation the kids are simulating i guess uh and when 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 we uh, in healthcare we think about the fancier end of the simulation um spectrum right uh, but uh, you're saying that no it it, it the sky is the limit there's so much one can do and i think what we did with those children at the hackathon was an attempt at simulation so i don't know whether there's a question in there yes i think there's a question here so 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 maybe maybe there are two questions here so sasha if you could if you could first tell us a bit about child centricity when when we talk mm -hmm. about um design thinking and we're mm -hmm. all from pediatrics, uh, at least the three of us over here are from pediatrics, pediatric emergency medicine specific. Mm -hmm. When we talk uh, about human centric, then um, then is it specifically, th then do you put yourself in the, in the, in the, in the uh, child's mind or the child's shoes and you empathize um, through that aspect or are you uh, more likely to empathize with the parent uh, or a combination thereof. So that's the design-based aspect because I want to get into child-centric design. And mm -hmm. the question for Jabin for, from this is that um, if you, uh, yes. So AR and VR, as is is that, and do you see that as an adjunct to simulation or do you see those as two totally different things, but they can, you can, you can bring them together if you want, but they have different uh, objectives and all. So I don't know. Um, so, so in terms of, I was just writing a comment and this isn't answering your question at all, but I was thinking of simulation in other industries, right? So I just can't emphasize enough that what simulation can mean in design, it's prototyping, right? You have an idea, you have to test it. It's, it's simulation, right? Jabin and I talk about this innovation, like that's the way to do it. But even in sports, it's like the practice game. Um, even in you know drama or performance, it's like improv or role playing. And so those kind of things, it just depends on what you call it. But it's all about testing ideas. But I can answer your question. Um, so so I think um, you know, for example, I I I worked on um, reimagining our procedure rooms in the hospital. Our hospital is doing some renovations, and the procedure rooms are small rooms really that look like dungeons that are used when children come in to have a um, a procedure like a biopsy or something that might be painful but not so painful that they need a, a general anesthetic or sedation so they said you know maybe you can work on these rooms and make them um better so so i do try and imagine what it might be like for the parent and for the child but better than me imagining and assuming 
what it might be like, we just go right to them. I mean, that's what you did. That's the ideal. So we spoke to children, you know, we did some workshops with them. We did some, we did some things just like you, some kind of arts-based stuff, draw, draw what you think you want it to look like, like describe to us what it could be like. We talked to parents in the same way, but then we also talked to the nurses, physicians, child life specialists, all the people that work in that room to say, what's your ideal? Like what, what doesn't work? You know, what would be amazing? And they gave us a lot of amazing um, and insightful feedback about what the room could be. And then we gave those recommendations to the basically the interior design and the clinical team to say, this is what you should build. And honestly, it, it's always surprising to me. It's not expensive stuff. You know, some of the things are expensive, but the, some of the things are simple. It has to do with like, I want privacy, make sure that like it's soundproof and the screen doesn't like let, you know, let people in the hall see me when I'm undressed, you know, can I dim the lights if, if it's too bright? Can I listen to my favorite song? Um, and then there's some, some more innovative things like, you know, the child and the parent want to sit on the chair together while they're having the procedure. We know that reduces anxiety, but no, no chair in our hospital is really built well for that. So maybe you create a new chair. You, that's an innovation, like something that a parent or a caregiver and child can sit together during a procedure. So there's like a sort of wide range of the sort of low hanging fruit and the things that would need to be created in particular for that solution. But you have to, I think you have to just always ask the question, find out the answer, go to the source instead of assuming what the parent or child might, you know, want. Great, thank and you. And I will take, yeah, carry forward what Sasha is saying. And because of the same reason, if you uh, like, I think two years back, in our simulation steering committee, which talk about what simulation will be, decide division uh, and strategic planning, we do have a patient and family representation on the, on the committee. Like we have a, a parent of a child who had been um, uh, like have a, some complex disease and has been exposed to our environment. And there's a young child who has some uh, disease as a child and now has recovered, but still part of. And the intention is the same to have their voice on the table. So if we are doing something, and especially another uh, highlight that I want to mention that now in our departmental research committee, we do have a parent and family representation because we are doing research on children and uh, <laughs> uh, taking consent from their parents, but we never involve them when the research is being presented. What, uh, what are the things which researcher has not um, uh, think about? Uh, like, frankly speaking, if you pay attention or not, we all have our blind spot. There are things which we, like if I have, I'm having this conversation, there are few points which Sasha is thinking, which I'm not aware of because our experience are different. Our lives are different. So uh, to minimize those blind spots, it is very, very important. And frankly speaking, we cannot empath uh, empathize to our parents until unless we have heard their opinion or heard their voice. So I just want to add on, and I'm so proud about it that we have on the, those four patient and family representation on the table uh, and they can say or they can participate equally as any member of the committee can participate. Great. That's that's great to know. Thank you. Thank you, Rayleigh. Yeah. Um, uh, and then, yeah. And then uh, Asad, you ask about AR and VR. Like me and Sasha are in this conversation for last one year. And it is very, very interesting. And uh, uh, we are not uh, uh, not representing any company or we do not have any conflict of interest. So frankly speaking, uh, what we I land with the conclusion that yes, if you want to show people amazing thing, AR, VR is very, very, uh, uh, it looks cool. Mm -hmm. There's no second point about it. It looks amazing. It gives you a new aura and everybody loved it. But how much you need it to mm. make your learners learn? Not actually much. Mm. It, it all depends how much resources you have, how, how what is your intention? Uh, so basically, if you look deeply into uh, virtual reality and augmented reality, the basic difference is virtual reality will take you, will disconnect you in, from the room which I'm sitting and take you into a virtual environment. And that environment could be anything. And augmented reality is 
we are sitting in this room and if i'm doing something i'm seeing and getting feedback in some form that is augmented reality and a very very basic example of augmented reality is um, uh, we do a lot of simulation with trauma simulation and other simulation where there's a role of point of care ultrasound so one way is to have the point of care ultrasound machine available in a sim center, or they, we will buy some very, very high cost uh, uh, applications which will show them the focus uh, images. But what we did simply, we put a barcode, we uh, connected that barcode to a video clip that is shown into a laptop or an iPad, and then when the learner put that uh, small kind of a probe kind of thing that scanned that barcode on the mannequin, and then that video clip start to play. So this is a low tech innovative solution with a very, very, the barcode cost us like, I think $1. And if you think about uh, high tech things, it will cost you thousands of dollars. So this is one example, but I will not say that uh, virtual reality does not have any role. It does have a role. For example, me and Sasha is working on creating mental health crisis uh, mm -hmm. cases. For that, we are using virtual reality because no matter how much you try to um, uh, take on, on board the standardized patient, no matter how much good you are in role playing, you cannot mitigate those emotions. Mm -hmm. And it will be monotonous because usually those people who volunteer are the same people. But we want to expose our learner uh, to various uh, mental health crisis situation in a safe learning environment without disrupting our emergency environment. So for that, virtual reality is a very good solution. So use it. So I would say uh, it's not about uh, the fancier technology. It's all depend. What is your intent? And what is your outcome? And if you align them well, there are many low cost innovative ways that you can utilize and that will uh, work synergetically rather than uh, a heavy cost burden on your healthcare system. So this is kind of my stake. Sasha, do you want to add on something? No, I, I, I totally agree. I think I think it's like you said, you're agnostic to the hmm. kind of to the to the industry. And, it, and it, I think it's similar, like even with design, like I, I wouldn't say I'm an expert in industrial design. I'm an expert in architecture, but it's all about finding what the problem is. And then, you know, thinking of what and testing different types of technologies as solutions. Can I say it? Can I say one more thing to kind yeah. of go back to the yeah. thing? Is that OK? Yeah, yeah. I was just thinking, you know, as. Jabin started this conversation talking about solutions and we can talk for hours about problems, but talking about solutions is less common. And I think what you do, you know, at your university and what we try to do is, is really try to um, encourage our students and trainees to, to be sort of solution focused and to, at least what I try to teach is you're not an expert. I'm not an expert, you know, if we fail, we learn and we have to test and to try to have the confidence to propose an idea, uh, which, you know, I get teased all the time in meetings because I'm constantly saying, you know, I was like, let's try this, let's do this. And I really, I get laughed at all the time, but over the years I've developed the confidence to say, I'm creative, I have ideas, I'm going to propose them. And hey, if 1% of them are stick and make things better, I'm happy to keep putting them out there. And I think to, to model that and to teach that to our learners, to say like, let's, you're in a position to identify problems and challenges. You're also the perfect person to start to think about solutions and innovate, create in what order, you know, you're at the table, you can do it. And I try to teach that when I teach um, at the university, at the medical school. Great. Those are excellent points. Um, and both of you have, you know, the, the, I, and, you know, we're almost done with the hour. Actually, I couldn't even tell this, this has, and I'm not just saying it for the heck of it, but this conversation has kind of flowed. Um, we've been doing this for three years. This is a third year of uh, MedJack webinars. Okay. And uh, so I think there's so much we could talk about. Um, I don't know, maybe there's, are there more comments or questions? I just want to make sure that if we could cover, uh, Okay, so there is a question. So question for Dr. Sasha. 
is that since you mentioned such an insightful example of hospital design, my question is, can effective hospital design, especially of ED, contribute to lessen the burnout of healthcare workers and staff? Uh, what are the frameworks we can adapt in terms of design to make hospital systems efficient, especially in LMICs? Yeah, I mean, it's almost as if I had planted that question myself. Um, I, I, I do, I, I created and teach this design um, course for, for physicians and clinicians, multidisciplinary people, some, some policy and whatnot. Um, and the whole focus um, of the course is basically on clinician burnout and wellness and refinding that, you know, we sort of lost our connection to, to work. So we, we focused it on, we wanted to try and make it low resource um, solutions. And so we, we said, okay, we're designing a ritual. We're not going to redesign the building. We're not going to, we, we really don't have power over many things, but we could think about different rituals and routines that add to our sense of wellness, sense of connection to our work. Um, and it was really interesting. We went through nine weeks with this group of clinicians to, we did interviews, observations. I don't know if you've ever heard of photo journal, like they took photos of aspects of their day and we analyzed that. All different ways to like kind of understand what the problems were and what the burnout was caused by for each person. And then we thought of what are the sort of different rituals that we could do or what could we implement in our day or our shift to improve things. Um, I'm gonna use an example. I think it's from, it's from the US. This wasn't from our course, but it comes to mind. Um, they, they created, they sort of put in these little chimes. And so when someone entered their shift, I think they, they basically, they sort of thought of so sort of something that they wanted to do on that shift or wanted to, to achieve. And then they rang the chimes and you sort of chimed in. And then at the end of the shift, again, you reflect, you chime out. So it was like both like a ritual, a sound, you had some intention. It was very personal. People could hear it though. And so it's a simple thing, like it's a little solution, but it's like, what can you do that doesn't really cost anything, but then can change your perspective and your um, mindset, you know, going in and out of a very intense and stressful work environment. That's a good- that, I don't know if that answered the question, but I certainly said a story. No, no, I, th I think I think your, <laughs> your storytelling actually is 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 really cool because it does address the question. I I find I think it does. Jabeen, what okay. do you think? Do you think um, the question was addressed, or would you like to add something? Yeah, yes, for sure, that definitely. And examples are always good, especially mm -hmm. your experience, because people can personally relate to it, and yeah. it's personalizable. So thanks, Sasha. You're welcome. You know, the other example that comes to my mind is uh, we do we do movement. We do Zumba and Salsa, <laughs> believe it or not. Oh, we like yeah, this. so similar. Not during, not, during, not during the ED shift, but afterwards, yes, at times. And so okay. some aspect of it, stretching, deep breathing, meditation, you know, uh, because of the stressful work of the ED. And I'm just using the ED's example because I'm an ED physician, but my team over here whether they want to or not, they're being forced to kind of start moving a bit as well. So it's it's fun. It's really interesting the way you mentioned um, rituals and routines. And these are simple, straightforward things. I love the example of chiming in, chiming out. <laughs> we badge in, badge out. Why do we have chime in, chime out? Uh, so uh, I, I, I think it's a great example. Okay, so I'm just cognizant of time. I don't think we have any other more any more questions or comments, but we're coming up to the hour. Um, so would you, would you, be um, kind enough to kind of, you know, leave a message each of you uh, for our students, perhaps um, nursing students, medical students, or other interdisciplinary folks, uh, innovators, entrepreneurs, whoever doesn't matter. But something that kind of you know helps them think through um, sector agnostic, um, you know, breaking those silos. Doesn't matter what discipline you're from, but you're there to create and innovate. Yeah, uh, I think when I was. Uh reading the chapter uh, Asad and was reflecting, I come up with few points, which I really want to emphasize at the end. First of all, embrace your vision and be a continued learner. I think myself, I learn. Right now we are having conversation and I'm learning. Collaborate, network. I would say embrace failure as a stepping stone. How many times I failed and as a result of that failure, what I get is even better, which I was intending to achieve before. 
So focus on user-centered solutions. And then resilience is your superpower. Don't give up. <laughs> and then measure impact, not just success. Uh, as Sasha was saying, uh, simple signage, it's not a huge success for people. But what impact it has, it's a huge impact. I would always caution myself and everyone on this call as well, do dream big, but start very small and celebrate small wins. So this is kind of my reflection when I'm going through this chapter and I will pass it on to Sasha. <laughs> Javine, honestly, I couldn't have said it better. I think I I completely agree 100% with what you've said. And Jabine and I have lived every word that she said. So I, I'm not going to add to that. It's perfect. Thank you, Zaja. And Jabine is a perfectionist. <laughs> I've worked with her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and yes. I've learned from her as well. So I remember one of the first shifts that I did and Javine was managing this child who was like kind of literally had stopped breathing. I'm like, oh my God, she's really good. And and we I think we I was signing out I was signing out and uh, and so and the and the kid crashed right there. I was like, great, Jabine's here. Take care. <laughs> um she's so, a perfectionist yeah. that she works so hard and tries lots of different things and collaborates with so many different types of people. So I think you know, it's a it's a wonderful example for students. Excellent, and and I hope that this is just the beginning of this particular conversation. I'm really glad that I reached out to Jabeen and and thank you, Jabeen, for being so um, you know um, uh, kind about like ac accepting the invitation. And Sasha, thank you so much, both of you, and uh, I'd love to continue the conversation somewhere, perhaps over uh, email, and then. My team would love to kind of, you know, get into some, I don't know, we can think through, right? it doesn't always have to be a project. And then Asad, I always think these kind of uh, sessions or webinar is just the first step. Uh, the success always come with creating the community of practice, not a one-time spot check. Mm. A pulse check is just when somebody is arrested for a continued well-being and wellness, a continuous process should be there. So I think this is our first step to create that or put our uh, small contribution to this community of practice. Excellent. Thank you. We are, uh, we are here. Medjack webinar, Medjack Kinneers, Strupreneurs, <laughs> Hyperpreneurs and whatnot. So um, yes, we're done with our time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. We've got people from different places. And thank you, Sasha. And thank you, Jabeen. Have a great day ahead. Thank you. Take care.